Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us here at Macaulay Honors College. My name is Jarmaine Lidlow and on behalf of Interim Dean Vanessa Valdez and the entire Macaulay community, I'd like to welcome you to our At Macaulay Author Series featuring Ryan Schulte, Class of 2018 Hunter College. This is our first event for the new year, and we are also celebrating Macaulay Honors College 20th anniversary. We are happy that we can curate programming that reflects our diverse community of students, faculty, alumni, parents, and the wider community community. I would like to introduce right now our guest. Ryan Schulte is a graduate of Macaulay Honors College, Hunter Campus, and a former volunteer at Word Up Community Bookshop, Libre Ria, Communitaria in Washington Heights. His book, Notes on Water and Blood, is published by Grain Ghost, Grain Ghost Press in 2020. And this is Ryan's first nonfiction chapbook and has now reached its third printing. His fiction has appeared in Hello America Stereo Cassette Summer Mixtape and is forthcoming in EOAGH Journal of the Arts. So he's currently here in New York, but he has been spending his time abroad. And so we are happy that he's able to join us tonight. Moderating the conversation tonight is Cam Stewart. Cam is our student writing specialist and facilitator of liter literary programs here at Macaulay Honors College. I'd like to welcome both of them to our program tonight. Thank you so much, Charmaine. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. So good to be here. Ryan. Hello. Good to see you, my friend. Yes. Good to see you, Cam. Congratulations on the book. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I guess I'll start with reading a little bit, and then we will have a discussion. Um, Sounds yeah. great. So this. This is from the first section of the book where I start talking about um, the Bruce Springsteen song, um, American Skin 41 Shot. And I'm kind of describing the way that I hear it entering my mind, thinking about it, which goes into a political kind of like memoir-ish discussion by the end of the piece. So, if etymologically, Melodrama is a composite of Milos, Greek for music, and drama from the French. There's a reason why this scene and Springsteen's song fixed themselves so deeply into my little conscience. Music and film can be unforgettable to us long before many other communicative things. Radio hit parades and sitcom reruns can impress us with the meaningfulness of an image or lyric or sound long before in our minds they really mean anything. As it happened, the scene, as well as my take on my relationship with my mother, were melodramatic, and perhaps derisively so, but because little else in my life seemed properly steeped in drama or music, I took what I could get and accepted it for undeniable reality. I took Fruitvale Station, peopled as it was with human beings that seemed to be the binary opposite of myself and my parents, as something of a redemptive challenge. As a very young person first measuring the distance between his origins and a hazy, lurid adult world that he so crucially knows is there, the more as his elders seemed to shun it, my first instinct, which felt entirely unprecedented in the history of my suburb, was to claim this new world as exclusively mine, a duty to contend with, a burden to bear, to bring relief as it determined the kind of direction for my fate even as its inconsistency and alienation were cause for fear. This zeal was not only old and unoriginal as my country, but also similar in primordial depth and age to a sensation that, if the reports of my ma and T.S. Eliot are to be trusted, does not diminish in pale or frequency with a person's advancing maturity. That is, when you are the music while the music lasts. It might last for a few seconds, but they could be formative as an epoch of geological time. This is not to say that early habits of cultural appropriation and possession cannot be detected and expelled from the psyche at any period of later life. They can, and the revision must probe as deep as accounting for the shame that undergirds the first error. At the same time, I got the feeling I might be a predestined criminal 
The selection of criminal over sinner or just foolish was interesting as it revealed my ideal of a total pejorative expulsion from decent society to whose laws I remained subject. This knowledge I determined to have come from my most private vital self, which no one could trace unless I related some or all of it to them. I would confess to Ma when she and I were alone. She'd listen, standing for a while like a doctor in the doorway of my bedroom and thoroughly disqualify everything. But I would insist before my small and pretentious crimes, punching my brother, watching porn, watching pornographic men's health exercise videos, amplified that some action had to be taken and my sworn intolerance for further passivity helped satisfy and mitigate this need. It could also stall, elicit sympathy and repel encroaching professional recommendations at once. Ultimately, I just kept talking about prison, which thank God got me nowhere. In this way, I never had to see her leave the doorway and she could be assured I was sitting unharmed in my room. That is from the, that's from, and the film Fruitvale Station that I um, mentioned uh, has, is about Oscar Grant, who was killed at the Fruitvale BART station on New Year's Eve in the late 2000s, I forget, it might be 2007, 2008. But it's a fantastic film directed by Ryan Coogler, who also did Black Panther, I believe. And um, I saw it at about the time that I listened to the Bruce Springsteen song. So they were the same subject matter kind of in my head where it's almost auditory, yeah. it was visual. Um, so I kind of write about the two of them in tandem, like bringing my attention to this um, historical present um, future um, situation. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. I know we're all just, yeah, so thrilled and excited about this book. And the first thing that comes to mind hearing you read that is this idea of a redemptive challenge um, in the context of, you know, the suburb that you grew up, the room that you grew up in, which may or may not be the very room no it's getting it's, a peek it's, inside it's room. yeah it's it's wow. this room. and i was like mom in the doorway like it's it's the <laughs> door. my parents are eating dinner downstairs and having giada de laurentis's pork chops as we speak um, <laughs> and yeah so it's a rare opportunity we get to kind of glimpse the work uh, yeah yes and the setting do. comes alive yeah um so I would just love to hear you talk a little bit more about what that redemptive challenge means now to you. You know, there was you as a developing boy and now kind of what does that mean? Has it taken on a new color, new, what, what does it mean? Yeah, um, yeah. I think it was very interesting about the book, you know, reading it because this was published, I was working on it I started it in 2017 um, and then I was working on it really intensely, I'll say, up until the summer of 2019, so pre-COVID. And then I was looking over drafts in like December of 2019 and then it came out in 2020. So it was right before, so this is like a pre-COVID, pre, you know, movement for Black Lives of 2020, pre all of that kind of like book, although certainly informed by everything that happened in Ferguson and Baltimore in 2014, 2015. But that, that's kind of like what it's current with. Um, but I'd say like, I'm much more interested in thinking about myself as like part of a group, like the kids of the white middle class or upper middle class who kind of like come out of high school where they're sheltered in some ways and not in other ways, but mostly sheltered in some ways. Um, and they say, well, this world is terrible. What has to be done? No, like obviously um, this must be some mistake. Obviously we have to do something in order to. And of course that isn't the best idea sometimes if not most of the time. But I think what, that kind of redemptive challenge, like what I was really fascinated at looking at 
both while I was reading this and reading it a bit after, is like that very first impulse, which is actually like very old. Like it was in like um, white New Englanders and the abolitionist movement. Um, then you get to like all different kinds of progress of white progressives over the course of the 20th century, like the temperance movement. And then um, the like upper middle class, like um, the Bernie Sanders who went and did like freedom rides and things like that. Like this is, a part of American history, obviously it's not the center of these struggles, you know, that's just false. But I was just interested in that because it seemed to be something that was both made fun of a lot, like if you like the snowflake thing, um, but also something that seems to be pretty common like in history as well as like even looking at, you know, um, other people, I grew up in Massapequa Park in Nassau County, which is a very, you know, um, majority white, there were kids of color in my grade, um, majority white though, um, community. And all of us who went to, the white kids who went to liberal arts school or even not liberal arts school, we all seem to have this idea as well. So you really start thinking like, obviously, you know, it's not the most effective thing in the world, but it's, it's certainly something. Yeah. Mm. No, thank you for that. and. This touches on another repeating idea in this work that I found um, is kind of this choice that we have to turn away from moments of discomfort. I'm thinking of the the parents at the Springsteen concert in your opening paragraph, yeah. actively like facing the exit. Yeah. Or you know, so we can just ignore the discomfort, or we can choose to linger in it and become curious and open to learning. And I'm wondering, I'm curious to know what you think, um, if the writer has a role in helping people linger in what's challenging and yeah. maybe some ways that the writer, the artist can help us do that. Yeah, yeah, I think, well, it's very funny because I think artists, a lot of us think that we're constantly dealing with like struggle and constantly dealing with like mining what's uncomfortable and things like that. Um, sometimes those are ego trips. Sometimes it's like we're setting ourselves up in order to be heroes in our own heads, like the Jordan Petersons of the world. Um, but um, the fact is that coming from like this like upper middle class, which is really, you know, the winner of the lottery in some respects, um, situation in American and global politics like what our status quo finds uncomfortable is just the reality for everybody else, which is not like news, obviously. Like you can go on Instagram and like find this out in three seconds and not hear me say it. But I think that for those like thinking of kids who went to my high school in my demographic, like for those of us that either became activists to some degree or artists, like it's definitely helpful personally to do these artistic things and to go and you know deal with what makes us personally uncomfortable. But then you get the question of like, this is a book, you know, ideally it's in a store, it's in an event like this, and then people are, you know, reading it. So what obviously it's not just a personal thing, because you you could write a diary, you could write like a journal, like um what is the interaction you have with um, your intended audience? And then what is the reaction you have with your like um, actual audience? So it's been very fun to kind of, as far as discomfort is concerned, like I'm not, maybe several family members of mine are on this right now, but like family members have talked to me about this and that's been very interesting because, um, you know, we all talk about like our like bubbles and like what we hear and what we don't hear. Like I have family members that are like, MSNBC or Fox News watching, um, like there's contingents, there's like camps. And, um, but you know, I'm building off of like a lot of the things I read in college, like Ralph Ellison's essays, James Baldwin's essays, and a lot of it's uh, Bell Hooks essays as well, rest in peace. Um, and it's funny because I know I'm, I'm, I'm quoting or I'm alluding to a lot of what they write, but as far as like a, middle class learned liberal leaning American, you know, now James Baldwin is like entering like the common consciousness, like somebody who like everybody should know. But um, I don't know, a, a lot of my family members were kind of like, oh, like I never thought of it like that. But then what they mentioned are like things that I alluded to. 
which I guess in a way is problematic because obviously they're not my ideas. But um, you know, the fact is they got the book, and this specific to my family members, they got the book written in a voice that's not the, different from theirs, which is interesting, not like the most necessary thing in the world, but fascinating to see. I hope that makes sense. Jeez. But. I think it does. It definitely makes sense. Um, you are talking a lot about radio in this piece, uh, movies, and they're kind of acting as portals into a another world where suffering exists mm -hmm. and it's kind of you know punching a hole through this veneer um and i'm wondering what other holes um what other portals have existed for you that have been meaningful um in the in the past um friends honestly i did a lot of very i worked in a well, you know but you know, to, to the world that the, I, I worked on a farm for a very long time, for, for a 20 year old, very long time. I worked there for two years, more, more like three years actually. Um, and then worked in like several other farms for the fourth year. So about four years, ever since I've been out of college, it's been just like working in these very rural areas. Um, actually, so that's quite a portal to be like having this visceral like connection with the natural world because like I was living in a, a caravan with like in walls but what I originally intended to say was like I did a lot of like very good reading when I was there since there was nothing else to do so I came across this um quote by uh Tony Cade Bambara and I think I came across an Annabelle Hooks essay I think she was she was actually eulogizing Tony Cade Bambara but um and I'm going to paraphrase it because I can't remember exactly what it said but she talked about like these transgressive acts that question the status quo and the way that the quote was presented I thought she literally meant um partly like just like going out with friends you know um participating in like um you know drinking drugs 60 stuff what have you it doesn't have to necessarily be that but I'd say like that in my teens not a lot of it I'm like a very introverted person but in my teens and 20s like that's very important you know just to kind of like I'd say definitely to connect you with other times in American history when all that was like a lot more widespread and there was a lot more like kind of, although there's a lot of questioning now, but like it's not the kind of stuff that you like see, I was just at the 60s. Um, that's very important. And I'd say like the, the infrequent times I got that because I was kind of like a quiet kid, those were definitely my portals when you just like really, really talk to people. Um, and sometimes you talk absolute, um, you know, sometimes you're, you're, you're languors, but um, it's, 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 it's important to, and maybe like currently, like you say, like, oh, like, you know, a, a safe space, um, you can really just like say the weirdest things that come to your head that maybe the status quo around you won't like, but yeah, that would be it. And then also I'd say um, family history as well strangely enough because whenever you get like a peek into something that's a part of you that happened before you kind of get an idea that the present isn't like a box isn't like something that you have to always think in terms of something happened before and then something's going to happen um forward um so i think that combined with the reading i was doing went into the book to start my interest kind of like in spirituality. And I talk a lot about um, this Bell Hooks book, All About Love, which everybody should really read. It's wonderful talking about like interpersonal affairs and things, but what I really got from a lot of it also is just her incredible reverence for spirituality, her own and also the peoples around her. And I, I was also living alone in the countryside in a strange country. But um, I think that family history and like this kind of like reverence for the past and access to the past, like set up the precedent for me to be able to receive that. Because you can't be very spiritual if you think that you're locked in this present that's never going to change. And then a lot of different theorists have talked about like the, the capitalist perpetual present. I've heard Angela Davis talk about that. 
um, Ursula K. Le Guin talks about like, oh, we thought that the divine right of kings was never going to be over and that now, and now it is. So maybe one day capitalism will be over. So I think that in a very kind of antisocial way as opposed to talking to friends um, was also a portal and was also very good for, you know, just like learning how to write and learning how to make the space around you in order to do it. Um, yeah. Those are a good question. Thank you. Yeah. I like what you say about remaining receptive. I think we so often can get closed off to that. And then the spiritual world just feels like something that's in a book, something we don't have time for. But I think a good piece of writing can kind of open that up for us again, right? And invite us no to yeah. that receptivity. Yeah, I think that's really important. Yeah. And you know, and when we're open to that, then small details can really pop and become alive for us. I'm thinking about um, your essay when you talk about the smell of garlic on your mom's coat yeah. and how that that kind of brings you to an exclusively adult world. And that in this essay, at least, that adult world is very kind of closed off, right? It yeah. isn't as tolerant as we would hope for our yeah. parents to, to be, at least in this essay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I'm wondering what the rules of that world are and maybe if artists have permission to keep at least a foot out of that world and in some place a little bit more playful in order to report back to us, yeah. to the rest. Wow. Um... I would say just thinking back to the um, the detail that you pointed out, it's very funny that not only did I think of myself like excluded from that as a kid, but also like even when I grew up, I would be not part of that, which in some ways has panned out correct. In some ways, of course, hasn't. Like everybody's everybody's judgments of what they will be when they're older are different. Um, but I would say that it's most important to keep a sense of what your childhood was like I'm at a point now where I this is something that I put out two years ago and I've done a lot of writing since um and I'd say like this book and then also some things I'm trying to get published now like they were my first like epiphanies of oh my goodness I could do this like a lot of things that I thought a lot of things that I didn't think I thought a lot of things that I was kind of like reaching for I can go out and say them um, and once you get over that like buzz, that high, and I did like, you know, I have like two manuscripts that I've been like shopping around and stuff like that. But now I'm kind of faced with the empty page, like, okay, so like now what do I do? Like, is that like the only thing that I have to write with? Um, but then I, I moved, you know, back here to my uh, childhood bedroom and everything like that. And I was unearthing a lot of like the drafts and things like that that I wrote when I was a kid. And of course, nothing changes like you know like I'm arrogant where I'm arrogant I'm inventive where I'm inventive I'm disappointing where I'm just you know everything's the same but that sense of like oh, oh why is this like this why is this like this why is this that is so important to have um I was journaling the other day and I was remembering an Emerson quote that I actually didn't read I think it was quoted somewhere else I actually think Jason Sudeikis said it in an interview once but like most men lead lives of I think quiet desperation or silent desperation um and then in like the same like day um if anybody who knows me personally knows that I have like this rap against call me by your name I think it's the worst thing in the world but then I watched it again because I'm just like oh let me see if I like um matured enough to understand what the hell's happening here um, and then there's a conversation between the father and the son at the end of it. And he's like, oh, like mostly by, you know, 30 people like lose all of their like want to do anything. And I was like, oh God, you know, that is smart. Like, why the hell was I talking about how bad this movie, you know, obviously like there are reasons why that's not the entire movie, that good moment. But, um, I think it's important to go back to that, like, childhood like enthusiasm I'd say it's probably like this enthusiasm where everything is new um like you see like a, a puppy going for a walk and like snow is like the best thing since sliced bread like it, it's important for artists to do that um and then also so you're always suspicious of that adult world that's the important thing because I think 
there's a lot also in bell hooks's essays um and I, I'm not, I don't think in the Love Trilogy so much, but in other places she talks about the phenomenon of um, people who were in the movement like she was, um, growing up and getting a bit more conservative, getting a bit more like bourgeois and things. And I think remembering that, I remember her like always talking about the spiritual. So like, it's not that she was resistant to all of that because, you know, she worked very, very hard to have like a sustainable, she was a professor in like multiple different places. She moved to New York so she could get like a, um, um, a wider um, audience for her books. She was published by Henry Holt and things. But at the same time, like she always had that distance from everything around her that wasn't quite distance. It was still very, very connected, but it was much more like how a child is literally living in a house or a bedroom and then can like look around it and be like oh you know not like everything's through glass um but probably the way that I can't think of a good metaphor for that shows how just like ineffable like it is and why we have to like hang on to it um yeah yeah the hanging on to it yeah that reminds me of that William Blake quote where he's talks about um, the tree that can move some people to tears is just for others another green thing in a way. And I think a writer's job is, is to move them to tears and to, to keep yeah. it from becoming that green thing that we just kind of move, shuffle by on our way to work. Yeah, 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 exactly. Exactly. I mean, and of course, there's so many ways you can like make fun of it. Like um, another mm. movie that I'd love to hate is the the Before trilogy, Richard Linklater, uh, Ethan Hawke, Julie Delphi, and she talks. Uh, I think maybe in the first movie when they're young, she talks about she's walking on the way to school and she would never get to school because she'd just be looking at the trees, you know. Which you're like, all right, lady, just like move on. But like at the same time, like there's sure. something really, there's something really. You, you you need to stay like that but also like not use it as an excuse or something to hide behind because if you go too far in the direction of like childlike wonder in a way you get like a trump supporter you know who's like oh everything has to be like so simple and black and white um so yeah yeah yeah, mm. yeah. it's an it's an mm. interesting question but also because like I'm, I'm basically still i'm basically still a kid i mean i'm in a you know in my parents house but like other than that like 26 like i'm basically child still so anyway mm. um, with some farming experience now with some farming yeah it's like it's like, like, yeah. two, like one like upper middle class childhood in the burbs and then one childhood where like i'm like digging my parents potatoes um and uh you know why not <laughs> yes um i'm you know i've had the pleasure of reading your work for about five years now um you know first encountering it when you were a student and then just developing this correspondence after so I kind of feel like I have a sense for your, your revision process but I feel like I've seen this piece when it was a bit longer and I yeah. think the audience would be curious to hear just how you go about paring a piece down um, what images you deem essential and what can be thrown out and it's kind of how you sort through all of that. Yeah, yeah. This piece has um, a very interesting revision history because, and looking back on it, I think part of it is that I'm really not a nonfiction writer. This is something I did for a college course actually. And then I kind of fleshed it out and I was sending it to a bunch of different places. Um, so when I, and I got an email from who ended up publishing it, Grain Ghost in like the fall of 2017. And um, um, the guy who published it, I, his name's Carl Anarumo. And thank you so much because he, I like ghosted him for like several months because I could not believe anybody wanted to publish it. And then once I realized somebody did, I was like, oh goodness, I have to put everything in this. Um, so it, might, it went through something like 20 proofs. Um, but I'd say the parts of it that got parsed down were those that were repetitive without really a use. But more than that, you know, I was I was writing something the other night, like, oh, like what would I like to say about this thing like two years on? The only thing I have like two years on. And I 
do like how it's so much once. It is about so many things. I mean, you go from, there's a part where I start talking about the doctrine of discovery and like the Catholic church's like role in like um, the Spanish and Portuguese colonization of the new world. Like I really just kind of like go off to use vernacular terms. Um, and that I really, if I were doing that now, or if I were writing something like this now, um, I probably wouldn't have been so quick to do that. I think because it was so like, first out of the gate, go. I was able to put everything in. Um, there were parts of it that I discarded that were, um, I had a whole part about Sinead. I, I started talking more about protest art at one point, And I started talking about Sinead O'Connor ripping up a picture of the Pope and how like important that was. Um, and I forget, I think, because eventually I said to myself, this is going to be more of a memoir, like a cultural kind of memoir. And the Bruce Springsteen stuff really um, was important to me because like, he was like an uncle. I mean that quite literally. Like if I go downstairs and go somewhere in my mom's car, like East Street Radio Sirius XM is what comes on. Like he is like the soundtrack whenever I enter my parents' house. So it was very important that I like, write about him in order to write really about anything. Um, also thinking about he was he was like lower middle class working class growing up but he also like was like a white kid of roughly my ethnic background who got to the 60s and 70s and said all right something's wrong um and obviously didn't save much um made a bunch of money but um had this interest in um how different it could be you know, so in my way of dealing, because a lot of it does like circle back to him, I start talking about like um, his like uh, uh, change of image in the 80s and things. Like, as I was dealing with whether he was worth anything for his professed politics, it's really a question of me, like whether I'm worth anything for my professed politics, because ironic as it is since it's published, but like I wanted to kind of like get my own estimation of myself before I came out and started talking about it kind of like in public and obviously I'm not an expert on anything but you, you want to be able to look yourself in the mirror um, because especially with this is another thing I was kind of writing like journaling to myself the other day like at the end of the day if you choose to align yourself with activist politics be an activist or do political work you really 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 have to do it because you want to like the want is very important not because you should not because you look around the rest of the world and it doesn't look like a white suburb and you're like wow this is crazy like no like it it it, it has to almost be like in the spirit of dissent like kind of like in the biblical sense like a real real like conviction that you really can't name not to make it sound like to walk this or anything like that um also i'm not sure why i want to include this too but um, talking about like childishness and talking about like the sense of wonder. I just, um, it's taken me like 10 years to read Philip Pullman's His Dark Material series, but I just finished the last book. And I was thinking recently about how like fantasy um, is, I mean, I'm the last to the party saying this, but fantasy and the fact that so many of us like came to writing by reading fantasy, especially when we were like middle grade YA age is like very, very important because that, connects quite well to the your phenomenon of sitting down with yourself at one point and saying like i want the world to be different or even better the world is different let me tell you why the same that i'm writing about it um so it kind of brought me back to the starting point that even like nonfiction like comes from really yeah thank you for that awesome. yeah speaking of starting points i don't know if you have it with you but i feel like people would really love to hear the opening paragraph to this piece. Oh. I don't know if you feel comfortable reading that. But oh, no, I just feel like that's great. that captures so much, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so, my parents' friends pay $200 for concert tickets and refuse to see the whole show. At the first notes of a recognized tune, they rise from their seats and turn their backs to the stage. Instead of the musicians or the giant screens above the stage showing their every twitch, the dissidents face exit signs glowing small and red and countless, 
along the curve of Madison Square Garden. They hold this pose for the shameful song's duration, its lyrics, which they object to, and I refuse to find objectionable, describe a teenager struck with 41 gunshots. Remarkably gruesome, but this musician, whom they claim to admire so deeply and whom they have commissioned via Ticketmaster, has written, recorded, and publicly disseminated many songs with comparable bloodshed, even higher body counts. And when performed, these songs are not met with contempt. One describes an auto plant worker that gets too drunk on Tanqueray and wine and shoots a night clerk, all because Reagan's bankers have foreclosed his house. On trial, as his mother and girlfriend scream from their seats, the murderer pleads guilty and asks to have his head shaved and body given to the execution line. Another song depicts a woman murdered by poverty, seen again after years of estrangement, her old lover finds her a dreary, and reclusive walking corpse. My favorite was an old man's lament for the cold last years of his love. He is not sure when his wife gave up the ghost, but she sure doesn't love him now and acts indifferent to any possibility that once she might have. Taken with such vengeful homicides and metaphysical casualties, American skin 41 shots should be unsurprising. Simply, a mother pleads that her son not get murdered by sinister armed strangers, and he does. An audience that apparently sympathizes with the dispossessed drunken killer, no backs are turned for that number, although a sizable contingent might head to the bar, should understand how the streets are ridden with danger and death has undone many. However, backs are turned and faith suspended when Bruce Springsteen sings, of how Rudy Giuliani and his NYPD dealt 41 death blows on a child. Sets yeah. everything off. Mm. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that image of adults actively getting up during a concert and facing the exit out of like disgruntled objection. I'd never seen anything like that before. I don't yeah. even, almost don't even care to know if it's true or not. It's just such a, a striking image. Yeah, yeah. You know? I, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of like Trump Trump rallies before there were Trump rallies, as if a mm. concert isn't a Trump rally enough, really. Um, but uh, it's, it's just, even, even that's very, very funny. I do have to say, and it's not, and I'm, I'd love to talk to a music critic or a music critic, either academically or music critic journalistically about this phenomenon of these build um, working class white rock stars who are very, not very progressive, but progressive enough um, dealing with their massive Trump uh, banner laden fan base. It's quite, and th there's, you know, you know, when you look at something and you're like, wow, that's something someone should write about. <laughs> because it, it, it really says a lot. It really, really says a lot. And I'd say like what a lot of the fans would definitely say, would not would definitely say, but like I'd imagine that from their perspective, they're like, oh, well, I'd have those politics too if I were rich, you know, because that's the kind of like victimized complex that that comes from. Um, but yeah, that I think around 20, no, probably when Springsteen did the Super Bowl, I was sitting with my parents for, at a Super Bowl party and they were like bragging about that. And my mom had to like go out of the room because she, if you ever meet my mother, she's never say anything bad about Bruce Springsteen. She'll throw a frying pan at your head or something like literally. So she, she was not, you know, she, she was civil, but only barely. I can um, duck pretty quickly. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. might you, have to. You gotta just, you gotta just uh, use your reflexes or something. Well, Spider yeah. Um, but, yeah so it's 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 just very because that's um because most of like either him or like you too um god help them uh or um even like john mellencamp they they all like profess to be like these progressive people which is like very different from the people who made them all of their money um is quite ironic i think I, like, ironic is like what you'd like call it you know um and he especially, I mean, he just almost became a billionaire, Springsteen, selling oh. his 
his Only back we could catalog. all have one of the shows. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. And then his, that's right. The song catalog. Yeah. Song catalog. I'm wondering how you take that. Does that increase an artist's responsibility? Does that render them totally, you know, invalid when they reach that level? Is it almost just hypocritical to say anything? I'm, you know, do, how do we wrestle with that? I, I think Springsteen for what he does is fine. Um, I think there was a point where he's like, am I going to be comfortable or am I going to be like there? And he chose like the latter and like did his like born in the USA. We, all those songs, like that album that got him famous in 83, all those songs were written very acoustically. Um, I know you've listened to it before, but if anybody's ever listened to the Nebraska album, it's very, very dark. And all of the um, songs on Born in the USA were originally written like that. And then he added all the instrumentation kind of in, in this transformation. Like I was just listening to um, Questlove's interview with Nelly Furtado. Like she did kind of like a similar kind of transformation going into like the loose era and like 2006, 2007, like from kind of like hippie to sex symbol. Um, what was very interesting about him though is like the whole male sex symbol part of it where like literally like his rear end is the front of the, um, but again, I'd love to talk to a male music critic male music critic, I mean, an academic music critic or a journalist music critic, like talking about that. Cause that, that says like, I don't know, that says a lot. Actually, it, it to talk about um, uh, something Bell Hooks brought up again, she has this essay about Madonna. Um, and at the end of it, she said, or at some point in it, she says like, it's very interesting that if you talk about Madonna or Marilyn Monroe, it seems to be that all our culture's favorite blondes are brunettes. And then if you think of like Springsteen's early music has a lot of allusions to bisexuality. And like, I've heard in like bars, people talking to me like, oh, that guy's gay, that guy's definitely gay. Um, that he ended up like cashing in, like also like making a lot of art, but like cashing in essentially as being this like, you know, stud. Um, it's, it's very interesting. It says a lot, doesn't it? About, you know, kind of like, how we think of ourselves, the presumptions that we have as far as like who is like the purest. It's almost like in order to get to a point of purity, you have to um, undergo this major, not as if, in fact, you do have to undergo this major renovation to um, get there. But then once you reach that point of like cultural preeminence where you're making all this money and then you're in, you know, in Madison Square Garden, um, things become quite interesting. It's almost like, people give you a free pass because it's like, oh, well, you know, he's, he's a musician, he can do all of that. You know, if it were, you know, my best friend or if it were, you know, my brother, things would be a little bit different, but he could, he could get away, you know. Mm. That's the country, I guess, mm. that's the culture. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Should we open up to uh, audience questions? Sure. Mm. Sure. Let's see, yeah, we've got one from Stephanie Hyacinth. Uh -huh. I'll read it. Um, regarding the turnbacks and or discomfort at the Springsteen concert, was it discomfort or did they think it wasn't a concern of theirs? So why should they be burdened? Their expectations were this is supposed to be music about them, not police brutality against Black lives. Um. So I'll just go off of what I heard back in uh, 2008. Um, it was discomfort because um, they saw themselves as sharply aligned with police officers. So they took it, I mean, what, 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 Stephanie, like what you're saying, like that certainly was a part of it. Like this is music, why is it about politics? Like that certainly was a part of it. But I think the intensity kind of the action, like literally the turned back is like, I'm loyal, like the Blue Lives Matter, like there's Blue Lives Matter flags like in the neighborhood, in this neighborhood. Um, it's like, I'm loyal to what you're insulting, you know, much like, and that's, you know, uh, I said there was a point where um, uh, the essay had like a whole section about Sinead O'Connor and all the stuff she had to deal with by like, you know, um, like Joe Pesci said that he would smack her in the face. I forget what, I think Frank Sinatra also like came out and said something really, really misogynistic about it all because like, and you know, these people are not monks, 
um, or anything like that. It's just this, um, it's, it's, it's culture wars, I guess, like acted out on the interpersonal level. Yeah. Anybody else wants to ask a question? Otherwise, oh. Hi, Renata. Hope everything is good. Um, is oh, sh should we read it? Should we read it aloud? The question. Yeah, you mentioned other writing that you're shopping around right now. Um, does it explore similar themes as what you read us tonight? Um, yes. How wonderful of you to, it does. They 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 do. Um, I would say I definitely start talking much more about sexuality in the other writings and about um, gay guys 100% just because it started being just like a dearth I saw and like what I was reading, just partly a self-inflicted thing because I read like books from the 1950s like a lot of the time. Um, but another thing that I think I started gravitating towards, which is very funny because it was a point where I was very into like Kerouac and like a lot of other beats and then kind of like completely dismissed them um, a few years later. But I started like going more towards an automatic writing, which I really don't like. But as I kept drafting like short stories and things like that, the amount of drafts I was doing got shorter and shorter and shorter. Um, and I would look at them like, you know, months after and say like, oh, do I really have to do any kind of like intervention on this? Try to do some kind of intervention on it and then say, no, the way that, the way that this, and I also, another thing, I started um, not using the first person so much. When I was younger, I would always say, well, even like at like 14, 15, I'd say, oh, why would you ever use like the third person? Like if I was reading something, I'd believe it if it was from the person's point of view. Um, and then I got really, really into reading like Eliot and James and Dostoevsky and a lot of like these masters of the third person of mission perspective. And I kind of like united that with the way that like someone like Kerouac or even Baldwin to a degree writes exactly like they're talking. Like all the Baldwin interviews that have gone, like gotten very, very popular recently. It's amazing to even read his fiction and you hear him, like the way that the commas are arranged and everything, um, which is, I, I wish we had a recording of Henry James speaking because I'd imagine with Henry James, it would be quite similar. Um, just the amount of commas that they're able to like use effectively is incredible, but that's quite a nerdy point to bring up. <laughs> Next question. Next question. Many authors cite, oh, this is from Akiko Yamada. Many authors cite specific places in New York where they do the majority of their writing uh, from Central Park to Joanne Chatur, oh, sorry, the screen. Joanne uh, Chatoria, did you have a writing spot as a Macaulay student or even now as an alum? Um, I had, this is a great question. Thank you so much. Um, I had several, um, there was this, although I do have to say the best, the Macaulay at Hunter students used to be, maybe they currently still are at Brookdale, which is like, used to be connected to Brookdale Hospital, I believe there used to be all kinds of things said about its history, but it's quite a building. Um, so I remember there was one January, I used to take some like, winter classes in January, but the last January I lived there in 2016, I just did nothing for the whole month and would like walk to the end of the uh, hallway, look out at, um, I think I was on like the seventh floor or something, but I could see, I could see the river, like I could see the East River and you kind of get like South um, Queens, North Brooklyn, like if you like walk if you go out of Brookdale, go all the way to the left, go into Waterside, you could see like the Williamsburg Bridge if you like are on there. But just from the window, you see like the moving river, which if anybody who's a T.S. Eliot had like, you know, just rivers, like we all just go nuts. Um, but river is a strong ground god. Um, but the, yeah, the silence and the, um, I think the temperature is also kind of a place. So like the winter, it's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful um, space. But coffee shops, uh, Irving's on Irving Place, um, Pushcart on uh, Second Avenue, I'd say like all around Brookdale. 
um, you know, when I started farming, it would just be my kitchen table because there was nowhere else. You were watching spinach grow. Yeah, mm, obviously, writing was faster than that. So yeah, <laughs> just barely. The next question comes from Stephanie Straffy. Um, how do you prepare for your next writing piece? Are there certain kinds of practices that you follow? Thank you very much for the question. Um, I would say that I like to work in dialogue with things that I'm reading. Um, so whether I'm reading an essay, whether I'm reading a piece of fiction that's current or a piece of fiction that's more like academic or historical, like even in my head, those are two separate like genres. I will react to that or even to, even to films actually. Um, like there's this one film I've recommended a lot of people, but we'll say again, um, Weekend by Andrew Hyde, it's an English film set in a Nottingham from like 2011 about two guys just spending the weekend together. The amount of stuff I've gotten from that, just like reacting to something somebody says in it is like really, really interesting. Um, but other than that, write down everything you're thinking, if you can stomach it, and then parse it down. Even if you just like write another draft without an idea of like what you wrote before. I say just like write as much, which doesn't have to mean as often as possible, but as much as possible, like write down as much of what's happening in your head, because it's all like, honestly, like it, it's all valuable. You have to be like a little arrogant about it. Um, yeah. Um. So no intense bowling or calisthenic routine before, I think is really what we were hoping. No, to hear about. no, oh, no, no. Oh. I mean, my body's perfect the way it is. I just, I almost <laughs> just get distracted looking in the mirror. So how do you fix perfection? There's so the truth, I folks. Um, we have, we have two questions. They're coming in fast. Okay. Um, Emmanuel A. Just want to say, I'm proud of you, dude. Also your visual storytelling is great. Ever think of writing with a comic book artist? Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I'd love to. I've never done it before, so I'm not sure how useful I'd be to the comic book artist, but um, 100%. Yeah. Next, uh, next question. Mm. This one is from Jana Naughton. Um, and when talking about family history, you discuss your time living in a tin cabin allowed you to become more in touch with your spiritual side and transcend the boundaries that constrain you from thinking of time as a box wherein only the present exists and how being removed from the passage of your family history allowed you to come to this realization. Do you think this is a spiritual epiphany you could have achieved if you were still living in New York or, um, or have the novel isolated settings of farm life that you have lived in the past four years contributed to such spiritual growth and change? Yes. No, no, Yana, you're right. Like 100%. It's, um, yeah, 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 yeah. I'd say that moving was always very in well, so like came you know like moving was also always very important to me um and the farming just was kind of happenstance like i needed a way to travel cheaply um but i also even for someone who like lived in the suburbs and lived in the city i guess i was like well the country is the last thing i didn't do so might as well try that and it ended up like doing the greatest thing for me, which was to kind of really leave me alone. Like I really liked solitude while I was here, but there it was completely different. Cause not only are you isolated from you know, New York, but you're isolated from, even like I was isolated from almost the rest of Ireland when I was living in Berlin. Um, so that isn't, however, I would definitely say that it's not necessary. Although when I used to hear things like this, when I was like, before I started traveling, I was like, oh, sure. But I really do think that it depends on the person. Like not, it's not like a rite of passage. Like not everyone has to have this like multi-year experience of like going away. It's very important um, if it's something that you need, but at the end of the day, it's you who knows that. Um, I'd say that like, I always kind of like had something like like something very close to, if not more than admiration for people who lead, led these very, very typical lives and wrote just the most incredible, bizarre things. Like, it's great. Like, we need, we need more of that. Like, the, 
the traveling should not give you the license to be like, all right, I'm an artist now. Like that's just me, you know? But the spirituality definitely comes from just like, like what I was talking about, like biblical descent, also the kind of tying in the, his dark materials that I was talking about before. Like, I think that's very important. Like when you have to do something that badly, it almost feels like bad, like evil, but you, but you have to do it. Um, and then that's where you kind of like allow yourself to interact with what becomes your art, what becomes like your friendship, love life, work life, everything. Um, yes. And I think, yeah. I think you touched on everything in that answer. Oh my God. Mm. Grand. Mm. Grand. Yeah. Your childhood bedroom is glowing. Yeah, there's a ghost of me here that's like screaming under the covers, like, ah, what did you become? <laughs> Don't that's worry. It. Don't worry. Oh. Well, thank you, Ryan. It's been a real treat chatting thank with you. you. Tam. I appreciate mm. it, man. And thank you, everybody Congrats. who's tuning in at home. Um, yeah, also, if, um, yeah, yeah, um, I think uh, copies of the chapbook will be at Word Up Books shortly they also i believe have a live stream event that's happening in a few minutes um yeah if you wanted to with you no 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 no, oh. no with another author it looks very very interesting um but i saw that i saw their calendar and i know that it's happening like at seven but i i'm gonna try and restock them if you want to buy the book in the city but other than that um they ship out of this is the book it's very beautiful um mm. it's like blue and gold which are also my high school colors that Grangos did not know, but fate. Um, yeah, they ship from um, uh, Massachusetts. And uh, I think like $6.50, I believe. Um, so you can get your copy. And always you know, find me at my website and reach out if you ever have any questions or anything. Thank you everyone for coming. <laughs> yes, thank you so much, Ryan. And thank you, Cam, so much. Um, I have my copy and we're also, we have extra copies. So someone in the audience, um, you'll be getting a copy of this as well. So thank you so much for sharing your experience, your writing experience and your time so intimately um, that you shared with us. Um, we really appreciate it. We hope that you come back once you finish your other writing. And I love you. And Cam, we hope to see you here on this program too, featuring you. So thank you both. Thank nice. you to the audience it. for joining us tonight. And hopefully we'll see you at another at Macaulay event. I appreciate it. Have a good Thanks, night. Thanks, everybody.